Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, since my connection is not great, I mean, if the audio is not good enough, I'll just switch off my, my video. So please tell me in that case. So yeah, thank you very much. I can hear you well. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And as I said, my, to uh, my talk, my topic for today will be open problems in PSAR theory. And I put uh, the logo of the EPFL here because during the first semester, um, I'll participate remotely and um, I'll be at the EPFL. But please do not hesitate to contact me if you're interested to discuss anything. And I'll, I'll be at the um, Institute for Advanced Studies during for the second semester of the special year. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about today. First, I want to start with a very brief um, motivation for modular representation theory. And then I want to introduce the PCAS-Sonustich or P-canonical basis. So we'll actually continue with some canonical basis. And in the end, I want to mention some first result about, uh, results about P-cells and mention one open problem at least. I hope that I'll come to this. So, okay. Um, so for motivation, I want to consider the following two open problems. And the first one is to determine the decomposition numbers for symmetric groups, for all symmetric groups SK. And um, what does that mean? That means you, I mean, you start with an irreducible representation in characteristic zero for a symmetric group. You choose an invariant lattice in this uh, representation and you reduce this um, uh, mod P and you determine which modular irreducible representations occur in there. And these multiplicities give you the decomposition numbers. And this is in general, um, a very difficult problem because the modular reducer representations are difficult to calculate. Um, another open problem I want to mention is to determine the characters of the indecomposable tilting modules for GLN for all n greater or equal than one. And so what is a tilting module? Just very briefly, this is a module that has a standard and a co-standard filtration. And it turns out that the category of tilting modules is it's called Schmidt, so you can look at these small building blocks, smallest building blocks, and these are the indecomposable tilting modules. And their characters, um, this has been a long standing open problem to determine them. And these two problems might seem unrelated at first, but actually by work of Donkin and Erdmann, these two problems are equivalent. And um, they up to maybe 2016, there hasn't been a lot of progress on these two problems. But then um, there was a very interesting new approach and a result by Achar, um, Pramod Achar, Shotaro Makisumi, Simon Rich, and Jody Williamson. And they proved that the certain characters of a reductive algebraic group can be expressed in terms of certain p Lustig polynomials. I mean, there's a small assumption on P and yeah, but um, I don't want to get to be too technical here. And the pika sonustich polynomials, these are base change coefficients between the pika sonustich or p-canonical basis and another basis. And so I hope to um, help that this is, at least for the people that are interested in modular representation theory, um, a motivation why one should get, uh, learn more about the p-canonical basis or pika sonustich basis. And so this is what I want to talk about next. So the pika sonustich basis. So where does it come from? Um, let me first introduce some, some notation. So um, we'll fix uh, an algebraically closed field K of characteristic P. And also we'll fix a simply connected algebraic group G over, um, over K together with a Borel B and a split maximal torus T. And um, W will be for me the finite or the affine val group. So the finite is just a normalizer of the torus modulo of the torus, or the affine val group that would be the semi-direct product of the finite val group together with the root lattice. So, and I want to view this as a Coxeter system. So in case you don't know what a Coxeter system is, uh, this gives a particularly nice presentation for your group. So the elements in S are generators and they're all reflections. So they're all square to the identity and um, two elements S and T in S um, satisfy, if they satisfy a relation, they satisfy something like a generalized braid relation. So STS equals TST, for example. And then, um, moreover, I wanna associate to this 
um, the hacker algebra, which we want to, I want to view as a, I want to view as a, um, as an algebra over Laurent polynomials in one variable. And so you can think of this as being a deformation of the integral group ring. So um, you take the basis given by the elements in our, in our um, group W and the new basis by deforming, um, I'll denote this by, by HW, and this is called the standard basis. And as I was mentioned earlier, these elements in S, they're actually reflections. Um, so they would, in the integral group ring, they square to the identity, but now in the deformation, we introduce the quadratic relation that the, the basis element corresponding to an element in S, S squares to V to the minus one minus V in parentheses HS plus one. Okay, and um, the last ingredient, which is the most complicated on the slide, but unfortunately I don't have the time to really explain this in detail, should be the Hecke category. So here I, I wrote down the diagrammatic category of Zerger bar modules. So in case you know this, or if you're more geometrically minded, you might think of parity sheaves on some sort of flag variety with coefficients. So for me, most of the time, I'll, the varieties um, it will, will be over C, but I'll look at sheaves with coefficients in my field K. So these are two incarnations you could think of depending on uh, what you prefer. And so now let me explain where this P canonical or P canonical basis comes from. And the main idea for this is actually um, categorification. So we start with this hacker category, which um, I mean, uh, is a graded monoidal Kroll Schmidt category. So, what does this mean? So, monoidal means we have a tensor product structure, and Kroll Schmidt means that any object in there actually decomposes as a finite direct sum of indecomposable objects. And from this, we can pass to a, its growth in group. But since it's not an abelian growth, um, abelian category, we have to pass to the split growth in group. So, the, the only relations we introduce is that actually the class of the direct sum is the sum of the classes. And <clears throat> so the reason, um, the next thing that Elias and Williamson show is that there is an isomorphism of ZBV minus one algebras between the split growth and group and the Hecker algebra I just introduced. So why is the split growth and group a ZBV minus one algebra? So the direct, due to the relation we introduced, the direct sum introduces an additive structure, the tensor product gives us a multiplication, and V acts by some grading shift. Okay. And now, um, as I explained, since the Hecker category is a Kroll-Schmidt category, um, we get a basis of the split growth in the group by looking at the Indian composable objects. And luckily, we have a parameterization of this. This is the last part of this theorem by Elias and Williamson that I mentioned here is that actually our group W gives us a bijection to the ending composable object in the Hecker category up to isomorphism and grading shift. And the ending composable object corresponding to W, I want to denote by BW. And now we can basically push over the spaces that we have of the split growth in the group to the Hecker algebra. And the image of this BW will be denoted by the P-canonical or P-canonical space element corresponding to W. So as you can see, this is um, a, also a canonical basis coming from a categorification. Okay, so <clears throat> just a brief recap. So the important parameter here is that P is a characteristic of our ground field. And the collection of all these um, PHWs is, a P, is called the P-canonical or P-canonical basis of the Hecker algebra. And so what kind of properties does this have? So the most important property or the most important result about this is actually um, Zerger's conjecture, was previously known as Zerger's conjecture and was proved by Elias and Williamson. And it says that if the ground field has characteristic zero, then this p kastanostich basis is actually coincides with the famous kastanostich basis of the Hecke algebra. And the other properties, two other properties I want to mention here is that it also satisfies strong positivity properties. So um, basically, if you take the Picasso-Nostic basis and express it in the standard basis, the base change coefficients, these will be these Picasso-Nostic polynomials and, uh, I mentioned during the motivation, and they, they will be Laurent polynomials with non-negative coefficients. 
So no longer poly, uh, polynomials, like real polynomials, as this is the case for, for the Kassan-Lustig basis. But yeah, so this is a generalization of the Kassan-Lustig positivity conjectures, basically. And the last thing I want to mention is that this basis is very difficult to calculate. So for the Kassan-Lustig basis, there is a combinatorial way to calculate it and no categorical input is, is needed. But here we really need categorical input. Um, yeah. And my main research interests actually focus around or revolve around this basis. So I'm also interested in how to efficiently calculate it using, I mean, find efficient algorithms for a computer. I also am interested in studying the combinatorics, the underlying combinatorics of these bases, and just try to, I try to understand as much as possible about the basis. And I want to give um, one example that comes back to this, um, to my motivation. And in this case, I want to show you the Pika-Sanustich basis in type A1 tilde for P equals three. So in this case, our, um, I want to look at the affine bar group, which is just the infinite dihedral group, generated by two simple refractions that don't satisfy any, any braid relation. And um, I want to, um, on the left-hand side, I've um, expressed the three kassan bases in terms of the kassan bases, and I've written this in a suggestive way. And on the right-hand side, I've given the tilting characters for SL2 F3, um, F3 bar. And each row on the right corresponds to the co-standard multiplicities of one indecomposable tilting module. And I just invite you to compare the, the picture on the left with the starting piece of the fractal-like structure on the right. And this is one example of how this Picasso basis encodes these indecomposable tilting characters. Okay, and now um, let me come to the last part of my talk, in which I talk, um, mention some results about P cells. And so first, first of all, uh, what are actually cells and why does one study them? So as I, as I said, the Picasso-Nussig basis is pretty difficult to calculate and also the structure, its structure coefficients are pretty mysterious because in principle, the structure coefficients are related to um, to tensor, tensor product multiplicities of tilting modules or, um, yeah, and so this is, it's difficult to calculate, but P cells give some sort of first approximation of, of the multiplication. So that's, that's the motivation to study them. And <clears throat> uh, in order, so what are cells? So in order to define them, we define a pre-order, which is called, um, which I'll denote by P right small or equal on my indexing set of the basis on my group W. And I say that X is P right smaller or equal than Y. If the pika sonosic base element corresponding to X occurs with a non-zero coefficient in a product where I take the pika sonosic base element corresponding to Y and multiply it on the right by any, uh, by any element of the Hecke algebra and express this again in the pika sonosic basis. And then the right P cells are actually the equivalence classes with respect to this pre-order. And similarly, left cells, I can just allow multiplication on the left, or two-sided cells, I allow multiplication on both sides. So this is a straightforward generalization of the notion of Kastanustich cells, if you know um, Kastanustich cells. And this is a very rich theory where there have, I don't know, there have probably been over hundreds of papers just published on, on this topic. <clears throat> and so let me um, maybe for time reasons, I guess, uh, skip this one. But, but uh, if you're interested in this, I can say a few more words about this later because I want to still mention the open problem. So let me mention um, the right P cells just to give an example in A2 tilde for P equals five. So on the left, you see the Kastanustich cells, which have been described um, by, by Lustig uh, in his first paper on uh, cells in affine value groups for A2 tilde. So how does one read this picture? So basically there is the, our affine value group in a type A2 tilde acts simply transitively on the set of alcoves. And after fixing an alcove that corresponds to the identity element, we get a bijection between our affine value group and the alcoves. And so this little black alcove in the middle equilateral triangle, this will be our, um, this is the identity element. 
And now I can just color the alcoves depending on in which cell they lie. And all, those, all the alcoves of the same color, they lie in the same two-sided Castanosti cell on the left. So we have three two-sided Castanosti cells, the black one, the red one, and the lowest one, the white one. And now the right cells in there, these are actually those, those alcoves um, that are connected in the way that one can pass from one alcove to another just by passing through, through a wall. So we have the red two-sided cell has three right cells, exactly these three strings here. And the lowest two-sided cell has actually six, uh, six right cells. Okay. And how does one get the right P cells in this, uh, in this setting? One needs to take this, um, this, this cone and place, um, place it, its tip at each of these six blue points suitably rotated so that it covers precisely one of the right cells in the lowest two-sided Castanosti cell. And I mean, this is just a starting point. As you can see, there occurs some interesting, there's some interesting fractal-like structure. Actually, this little right cell here can be seen as, as a repetition of actually the identity cell. And then the unique reduced expression cell, this repeats as a, I mean, again here somehow. And everything repeats again, like enlarged by a factor of P further out and further out and so on. So this is a fractal that kind of grows bigger by a factor of P each time and not smaller. So it's not necessarily like we may not be used to this. And this is a very intriguing structure and this is no coincidence actually. So let me mention um, one conjecture about, uh, about P cells and for this, I need to give one more definition. And a right, a right cell um, is called antispherical if it's contained in the set um, FW. So this is the set of all the elements whose left descent set does not contain a simple reflection from our finite value group. Okay. And then um, I want to mention two bijections. So due to work of Lustig and he, we have a bijection between antispherical right Castanosti cells. Um, Lustig called them canonical cells and two-sided Castanosti cells. So if I take a two-sided Castanosti cell, I can just intersect with this with a set and I obtain a, a unique uh, right cell on there. And probably one of the deepest results that Lustig showed um, um, about Castanosti cells is that there is a bijection between the two-sided Castanosti cells in the affine value group and the neopotent orbits in our Lie algebra G here. Well, I'm, I mean, in principle, there should be a Langdon zero, but this is kind of hidden in, in my notations. And by chasing these two bijections, I want to associate to a Castanosti right cell C, a neopotent orbit OC. And now there is a conjecture which, um, I mean, I don't give a precise formulation, but give you an impression for this is, so um, if one wants to determine how this Castanosti cell decomposes into right P cells, uh, what one needs to look at is one chooses a point in this, um, in the corresponding neopotent orbit, looks at the stabilizer. This has a reductive quotient, which is a reductive but potentially disconnected um, algebraic group. And this group actually governs the decomposition behavior. And what I wanted to mention, I mean, the last thing I want to say is that actually the last, this last slide here is already a first example for this because the nearpotent orbit corresponding to the lowest two-sided cell is a zero orbit for which the stabilizer is just the whole group. So we kind of, this, this conjecture predicts that we have this kind of like fractal-like repetitions. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention and yeah. Thank you. Questions? Oh, yeah. uh, yes, I have a question. Can, can I ask? Hello? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So for this, uh, for this P equals zero, there's one case in which these polynomials can be explicitly computed, which is Elements of maximal length in a double coset respect to value group. Then there's a key formula. So I wonder if such a formula exists also in this P, P canonical case. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, no, no. I didn't really understand no, no. the question. So, you, so you take up a var group and it has a finite var group as a sub subgroup and can yes. take double cosets. Yes. And each double coset, there is unique element of maximal length. And so they take by dominant weights and then therefore two such, two such uh, things, two such uh, elements of this kind, the corresponding polynomial is actually explicitly known. It's, a, it's some, you can write a formula for it. Not algorithm, but a formula. And okay. the it is known in this P, P canonical case. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think so whether this is known. I have not thought about this. So, but I, I, I would need to think a little bit more about this. Okay. But, yeah, it's a it's an interesting question, but yeah, I mean, I I'm not sure right now. Okay. Well, so if um, there are no other questions, thank you.